our series of gospel meetings. We're delighted that you're with us tonight. <clears throat> we have uh, several visitors with us tonight. We're delighted that you're here, and uh, we have some who have come from uh, other sister churches, and we're glad that you have come to be with us. Uh, some of our people are uh, sick and going through various problems, and we want to remember them in our prayers. Barry Cahoon's son, Jason, is doing better, but uh, he still has ways to go, and we need to remember him in our prayers. Barry King is recovering from surgery, uh, Lola tells us. Sue and Durell Walker, let's be sure to remember them. Uh, neither of them is feeling really well. Uh, Sue, of course, is undergoing treatment. Mary Jo Hackett is feeling some better, Tony tells us. And uh, we also have been asked to remember uh, Ronnie Anderson. Many of us know Ronnie. He's going to be having colon surgery in the morning at the local hospital. And uh, we have been asked by Candace and, uh, to remember him in our prayers. We appreciate uh, all of those who have given us notes. And there may be others who are sick. If you have some others that we need to mention, well, let me know before... Get me a note before the service is over, and we will mention them at the end. Uh, <clears throat> we have serv uh, several things that we need to thank everyone for regarding the meeting, but we will save that until the final announcements tonight at the end. Uh, we have Brother Gary Wilder and his wife with us tonight, and uh, at the proper time, Brother Wilder will lead us in our uh, opening prayer. I see that uh, the Brush Creek brethren are here, Glenn and Judy, and uh, they have made it in. It's good to see all of you. I think they've dismissed their services tonight to come and be with us, and we appreciate that. Folks are still coming in, so the ushers will help them uh, make their way in, and Jeff Crockett has done a superb job leading our singing throughout the week, and we appreciate his work in that regard. And uh, number 732 will be the opening song if you use a song book. And uh, the songs will be on the screen as well. And uh, you can utilize that as well. But we're just so happy that you're here tonight. You're here for the first time. Uh, our speaker is Brother Chad Ramsey from Tupelo, Mississippi. And I haven't said a word about Elvis. Uh, you know, usually I think, isn't that where Elvis is from? And but we're, we're glad Chad Ramsey came to us from Tupelo. He has done a great job in preaching and teaching the Word. We want you to take your Bible and follow along with him. He will call upon us to do that. And uh, he has just done a remarkable job uh, preaching and teaching and handling aright the Word of God. And we love Chad and appreciate him for his work as a gospel preacher. And, of course, he was born here in Carthage and uh, was part of this congregation for a couple of years before his dad and mom uh, moved to Bobby Branch in McMinnville, and uh, he has made his way back home. So we're glad that he's with us for the final service in this meeting, and it has been great. If you need a copy of any of the lessons, we're taping all of them, and they will be available. Get us a name and an address. And we will mail you the CDs if you'd like those. I believe you can get also on DVD if you would like that. Without further comments at this time, Brother Jeff, come and lead us in our song service. <clears throat>
Dear Heavenly Father, we are indeed grateful for this opportunity to approach thy throne of grace through Jesus our Lord. We are thankful for opportunities such as this to be together. Most of us are together with those of like precious faith on every Wednesday somewhere in this area. And we are thankful for these opportunities. Especially are we grateful for the planning of this meeting that brings Brother Ramsey back to this area again. We're thankful for his work, his local work, and the work that he does through the pages of the Gospel Advocate and the books that he has written. And in prospect, we're anxious for those that will come from his mind and his pen in the future, thy will be done. We're thankful for this congregation that meets at this place and for the good that they've accomplished for so many years, for the leadership that is in place and has been in the past, and for the men who've occupied this pulpit over the years, and for their families. We're grateful for the good that continues to be accomplished because this, as all other communities, needs the influence of godly people. Still, there is the desperate need for salt and light. And we pray that as we examine ourselves daily that we can be in the best position that we can be to be thy representatives wherever we go. Father, we are thankful that we live in the time that we do, even though there are many changes that we would like to see. We are still grateful 
to live when we do. And we're thankful that things are as well with each of us at this time as they are. We're made aware of many of this number and connected with this congregation in some way and in this community who have needs, and some of these needs are desperate regarding their physical well-being, and we ask thy blessings to be upon each one. Please suit to them the blessings that are most appropriate and needful. As generally is the case, there are some who simply will not see much improvement. We pray for these individuals, first of all, that they are prepared spiritually, and we pray for their families. Help us all to see the need to be faithful and help us all to be aware of the fact that we're not permanently situated here. Indeed, we're here just for a very short time. We ask thee to continue to be with those who try to help us to be well in the medical profession. We're thankful for strides that have been made and improvements so that many of us are here this evening due to this. And the quality of life that we have, we're so thankful. We pray for those who are trying to keep us safe from harm. And we pray that those not only in our areas but across the land and around the world, we pray for them that are determined to do harm to their fellow man. We pray that they will change their minds. And if that is not the case, we pray that their efforts will be turned so that we can, as much as we possibly can, live peaceably with all people. We pray for every good work in the kingdom, the works that this congregation is involved in and others that we know of. We pray for their success, continued success, and we're thankful for the good that's been accomplished up till this point. Father, there are many among us who are grieving at the loss of loved ones and friends. We pray thy blessings to be with us all in that regard. May these experiences remind us of our own mortality, and may we be determined to make the best use of whatever time we may have left upon this earth. We ask thee to continue to bless our feeble efforts in enlarging the borders of thy kingdom. And we are anxious to meet those who have gone before, who are among the faithful, especially our family and our friends. We look forward to seeing them again. Help us all to have that strong desire to go to heaven and to be an encouragement to as many as we possibly can to do the same. Bless Chad's efforts here this evening that he has chosen those words and theme that will be most useful and beneficial to us all. Forgive our sins as we repent and we pray for those who have not yet rendered obedience unto thee, that they might turn to thee before it's too late. It is in the name of Christ we pray. Amen.
as we have said each evening, we're truly thankful for your presence tonight. We appreciate very, very much the opportunity that we have to be together. And it is a wonderful blessing for us to be able to close this day by singing songs of praise to God, by offering up our prayers, and by opening our Bibles to seek to find God's answers to the very real problems that we have in this life. It's been a blessing for me to be with you throughout the course of this week. I thank you for your kindness, for your hospitality, for all of the wonderful meals that we have enjoyed this week and all the hard work that went into preparing those. And we truly appreciate very much your kindness. This week we have been considering a theme based on Hebrews, the 12th chapter, and the third verse. The writer of Hebrews was addressing individuals who were on the cusp of giving up Christianity and turning back to Judaism. Some, perhaps, were ready to go into the paganism offered by the Roman Empire. And he reminded them of how Jesus is greater, superior to Moses and his law, to the high priest in every conceivable way. In the 11th chapter, which is one of the more familiar texts in that book, he provides multiple examples of individuals who were found faithful, individuals who did what God told them to do, who acted by faith. But in the 12th chapter, he goes on to remind us that there is one who is even greater. And this is what he says in verse 3. Consider him who suffered such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. The ultimate example for us to consider is Jesus who is the Christ. And so during this week, we have sought to consider our Savior by thinking about the death that he died and the message of the cross. By thinking about the fact that he defeated death, that his tomb was found empty, and the lessons that we can learn therefrom. By thinking about the church that he is the Savior of, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23. And then last evening, by thinking about the blood of that he shed in his death. Tonight we're going to conclude this discussion of our Savior by focusing upon one of the great promises that I think we find anywhere in Scripture. It's found in your Bibles in John chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. John chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know. And the way, you know. If you're familiar with the context of John the 14th chapter, you know that Jesus spoke those words in an effort to provide comfort to his apostles. He had just told them that all of them would betray him that very night. And although Peter said, Lord, I will die before I betray you, Scripture shows us that Jesus was right. Jesus knew their hearts. He knew what they would do. He knew how they would act. And he knew they needed great reassurance. 
He knew that they needed a spark of hope that could get them through the dark and the trying days that they would face ahead of that time. And so he offered to them one of the most beautiful promises that we find anywhere in God's Word. I'd like to suggest to you this evening that this promise that Jesus made in John the 14th chapter isn't just a promise that could give hope to the apostles. It's a promise that you and I can be encouraged by as well. If I were preaching at home tonight, I would know that there are a variety of individuals in the audience who are suffering with great difficulty. There would be some of the individuals there who would have a loved one on their mind who is at the point of death. Funeral's going to be any day. There would be some young people in the audience who would be wondering if their mother, who's 45 years old, is going to really be able to live through the chemotherapy that she's facing and whether she's going to be able to overcome cancer for the second time in about four years. There'd be some folks who were wondering how they were going to pay their bills because they just lost their job. And they're not sure what's next. There would be some individuals in the audience who are thinking, are we really going to be able to make this marriage work? Can I forgive him because of what he's done? Can I forgive her because of what she's done? There would be some individuals in that audience who would be worried about their children. Why won't they do what God's Word says to do? I don't know all of you as well as I know my people back in Tupelo. But I know this. The folks in Tupelo, Mississippi aren't the only ones who are carrying a burden on their shoulder. All of us face difficulties and trials of various sorts. And because of that, the words that Jesus speaks in our passage tonight are words that you need to hear. We don't have to allow the difficulties of this life, the burdens that seem so great that we think that we're not going to be able to bear up underneath them, We don't have to allow all of those trials and struggles to overcome us. And we don't have to give in because of what our Savior has said. Now it's interesting as we think about this passage in John the 14th chapter. The text that I read for you a moment ago, John 14 beginning in verse 1 through verse 4, really only has one main point. Brother Edward and I were talking today about sermons preached in the past. He said he had one that had ten points one time. Well, I'm going to have one tonight that has one point. It is the point that you find in John chapter 14. And here it is. You do not have to falter under the burdens of life. That's the point of John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. You do not have to falter under the burdens of life. Notice how Jesus begins, Let not your heart be troubled. That word let is an important word because it means you have a choice in the matter. You can either allow the burdens of life to overcome you or you can fight back you can realize that this world is not all that there is. That there's more. And you can live in hope of the promised eternity in heaven that God has prepared through His Son, Jesus Christ. Now that does not mean that the difficulties that you face should be minimized. I would no more minimize the problems that you are encountering here in this life than I would minimize the problems that the individuals to whom I preach in Tupelo are facing that I know are all too real. 
And I understand that sometimes the problems that we face in this life are capable of causing us even to turn away from Christianity. That's what the parable of the sower teaches, isn't it? In Luke the 8th chapter and the 14th verse, the text says the ones that fell among thorns are those who when they have heard go out and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. It's not just riches that choke those individuals. Sometimes it's the cares of life. Those burdens with which we struggle. And I also know that sometimes the problems that we face in this life are capable of convincing us that God doesn't care. And how many times did the prophets wrestle with that same thought? Habakkuk didn't understand. He said to God, you are of pure eyes that behold evil and cannot look upon wickedness. How can you allow this to happen? Jeremiah didn't understand how God could allow him to continue to suffer even though he was doing what he ought to do. Sometimes we feel that way. We need to be reminded of Jesus' words in Matthew the 6th chapter in verse 31. Therefore, do not worry saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear. For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. I understand that the problems of this life are capable of causing you to turn away from the Lord, to think that He does not care about you, or to even get to the point where you're ready to give up. That's where Job was. After his friends sat with him for seven days in silence, He broke that silence in Job, the third chapter. And he said in verse 25, The thing that I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, for trouble comes. I understand that the cares that you face in this life are real, that they are great. But I believe my Savior's promise. When Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled, I believe the implication of that statement. And what that statement means is that I do not have to falter under the burdens of this life, no matter how great those burdens may be. Now, I told you I was only going to have one point. That's true if you're thinking only in terms of a technical outline. The one main point of John chapter 14 is you don't have to fall under the burdens of life. But what Jesus does in the next few verses is to provide the reason. Why don't we have to give up? Why don't we have to falter? Why shouldn't I quit? He answers. And that's where we're going with the remainder of our time. You don't have to falter under the burdens of this life, number one. Because God and Jesus are real. Look at what he says in John 14 beginning in verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Now why would he say that to the apostles? These are individuals who have witnessed the wonderful miracles that he has performed during the period of his ministry. They were with him when he opened the eyes of the blind. They were with him when he made the lame man to walk again. They were with him when he fed the multitudes. They were in the boat when he walked to them across the water or when he stilled the storm. They were standing at the tomb of Lazarus when Jesus cried out, Come forth! They had seen who he was by the miracles that he performed. As a matter of fact, a little later on in this same passage, Jesus emphasizes that they should believe in Him for that reason. Verse 11, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. You can believe that I am who I say I am because of what I've done. 
But what's he doing? Why tell them you don't have to falter under life's burdens because God and Jesus are real? For this reason, it's very easy for us when we are struggling with the difficulties of life to become self-absorbed. To begin to think only in terms of the problems that I face, of my difficulties. And to look at others and to assume that they're not carrying the same burden upon their shoulder that I'm carrying. And to become disgruntled. Why am I the only one who's facing this difficulty? Why am I the only one who has this great trial in my life? But what Jesus is actually doing is trying to show the apostles that there is something greater than you. And as great as the burdens you have are, the God you serve is greater. Now we have many reasons to believe that there is a God. And we could spend our time, and I've done that in days gone by with various works that I've been involved in, seeking to prove God's existence beyond a reasonable doubt. And we could talk in terms, for example, of what we might call empirical proofs. And those are things that can be measured. Things like cause and effect. If there is an effect, there must be an adequate cause. And some of the main arguments for the existence of God are based on that line of reasoning. Let me simplify it, though, a good bit. My granddad used to say something like this. He would say, if you see a turtle sitting on top of a fence post, you know that he didn't get there by himself. Now, you can understand that, can't you? That's the idea of cause and effect. When you see a house sitting out in the field, you know that that house didn't get there by itself. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 4 says, every house is built by someone. We understand that, but he who built all things is God. That's the idea. The great effect that exists is this world in which you and I dwell. What's the cause of it? The writer of Hebrews says, God is. You understand that every house is built by someone. Can't you also see that something greater than a house is built by God? Yes, empirical proofs help us to the conclusion that there is a God. The psalmist put it this way. Psalm 19, beginning in verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows His handiwork. How do we know that God and Jesus are real? Perhaps by the empirical proofs. Perhaps by the very miracles that Jesus performed while He was on the earth. Or perhaps, as we mentioned Sunday afternoon, by the fact of the empty tomb. When Paul preached in Acts the 17th chapter, he highlighted the importance of that empty tomb. He said, because he's appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. And he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. The fact that the tomb of Jesus is empty means all the world to those of us who claim to be Christians. If Jesus truly defeated death, you and I can face whatever this world brings because God and Jesus are real. But our passage doesn't just say you can bear up under the burdens of life because God and Jesus are real. It goes on to make another very significant point. You can bear up under the burdens of life. You don't have to falter under life's difficulties, not only because God and Jesus are real, but you don't have to give up under the difficulties of life because heaven is real. Look at what Jesus goes on to say. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, and I go and prepare a place for you. What's he saying? Not only is it the case that God and Jesus are real, but his father has a house with many mansions. It is a real thing. And so those who are troubled, those who are burdened, those who are struggling, no matter the situation, 
can look forward to a reward that awaits those who are faithful. Heaven is described in Scripture in a variety of ways. It's described as a city in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 2. And thus it is the home of the redeemed. It is described as a tabernacle in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 3. And thus it is the home of God. It is described as a place that is free from sorrow where God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4. It is described as a place where sin cannot enter. A place free from sin and wickedness. Revelation chapter 21 verses 7 and 8. It's described as a garden, a true paradise. Revelation 22 verses 1 through 5. And this heaven that is real also illustrates to us the very real nature of our God. He is a loving God. That's why He sent Jesus to the earth to die for us, to die in our place. And He is a gracious God. And that's why His plan isn't limited in scope, but it is available to all. Titus 2 and verse 11, The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And yet He's also a long-suffering God. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning His promise as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If you're struggling tonight under the burden in this life, hear the words of Jesus. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go and prepare a place for you. You don't have to give up under the difficulties of life because God and Jesus are real, because heaven is real, and because the possibility of salvation is real. I go and prepare, Jesus said, a place for you. Do you see that? Not, I'm going to prepare a place for others. I'm going to prepare a place for you. When you're facing the difficulties of this life, do you think in terms of the fact that there is a place prepared by our Lord for you? Not that He loved the world that he loved me and that he loved me enough to make it possible for me to have an eternal home with him in the heavens when the writer of Hebrews mentioned that in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9 he said very simply but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone Now that word everyone is an inclusive word. There's not a single person here tonight that doesn't fall into that category. When Jesus died on the cross, he died on the cross because of you and for you. Do you see that? The blood that he shed upon the cross was shed because of your sins. And the blood that he shed shed upon the cross was shed so that our sins could be forgiven. So that we could have the eternal home in the heavens. And so instead of giving up and quitting, we are instead to consider our Savior. The one who suffered such hostility from sinners against himself. Lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. It's interesting to me that the writer of Hebrews understands the fact that discouragement occurs. He doesn't say that such won't happen. He doesn't say that you won't have those kinds of thoughts. He understands that you could. But he also understands that Jesus makes it so that you don't have to give up. The point of John 14 verses 1 through 4 is very simple. You do not have to falter under the burdens of life. And if we ask the question, why not? 
Why don't I have to give up? Why don't I have to falter? Why should I keep on keeping on? Jesus would answer, number one, because God and Jesus are real. Number two, because heaven is real. Number three, because the possibility of salvation is real. And number four, because the return of Christ is real. Notice what the passage goes on to say. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will Come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Is Jesus going to come back or isn't he? That's an important question, isn't it? If it's true that heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people, it is just as true for us to say that our Lord will come back. Now the angels told the apostles this. In Acts the first chapter, they were with Jesus when he ascended into the heavens. And in verse 9 of that text, the Bible says, When he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward the heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. In other words, he's going to come back. And so you have the testimony of the angels and you have the testimony of Jesus. And Peter didn't forget that. Because when he wrote 2 Peter chapter 3, he wrote these words in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Christ will come back. The world will be destroyed. The judgment will take place. And all of that will happen because this world, as much as we focus upon it, is not all that there is. It's so interesting to me that so many of our trials and our burdens and our struggles are tied to this world. Yet this world is going to be destroyed. Part of our greatest problem is that we spend so much time thinking about right now that we fail to think about that which is to come. But Jesus said you don't have to give up. You don't have to falter under the burdens of life because God and Jesus are real, because heaven is real, because the possibility of salvation is real, because the return of Christ is real, and because the possibility of knowing God's plan is real. Go back to John 14 and let's notice how Jesus ends this section. He says, and where I go, you know, and the way, you know. We live in a period of time in which absolute truth is under attack. Individuals tend to act as if it is impossible to really know what is right and what is wrong. When Jesus speaks to his apostles, he does not act as if there is any room for doubt. Where I go, you know. Could they know? If they believed what he told them. And the way, Jesus said, you know. It reminds me of what he said to them earlier in his ministry, John chapter 7 and verse 17. He said, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God 
or whether I speak on my own authority. You can know the truth, friend. You can know the truth about the existence of God. You can know the truth about the reality of heaven. You can know the truth about the plan of salvation that will allow you to have that eternal home in the heavens. You can know the truth about the return of Jesus. And you can know that there is absolute truth upon which you can stand and base your hope. And only, only when you have that sort of grasp and a foundation upon which to stand can you truly understand what Jesus was getting at when he said very simply, let not your heart be troubled. In my judgment, the promise that's made in John chapter 14 is one of the greatest promises in all of Scripture. I'm thankful that life's burdens don't have to be so great that we falter beneath them. I'm thankful that there's more to my existence than just the problems that I face. That there's more than just this world. I'm thankful that heaven has been prepared by our Lord and that I have the opportunity to go there and that He will return and that I can know it. This evening I'd like to ask you if your life is right in God's sight. The Bible teaches us that we can become a member of the bride of Christ, the body that Jesus is the Savior of. And that we're baptized into that one body, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. After we have heard the word and believed it and repented of our sins and confessed that Jesus is the Christ. And it might be tonight that you've done that and days gone by, but you haven't lived like you should. And maybe, just maybe, you have faltered under the burdens of life. And you need to be reminded that God and Jesus are real and that heaven is real, and that the possibility of salvation is real, and that the return of Christ is real, and that truth is real. If your life is not right, God will forgive you if you are willing to repent. You need to respond to our Lord's invitation. Don't delay. Come right now. As together we stand and sing.
315 will be the closing hymn. But after the singing of that song, we're going to ask Brother Chris Hicks to come and lead us in our final prayer in, for the night and for this series of meetings. We appreciate so much the presence of each one of you tonight. All of us have been blessed. We have been reminded of some powerful, powerful truths. Chad has a way of organizing lessons and presenting them in a very effective manner, and we appreciate so much his ability, and uh, the simplicity of the lessons are really profound in their implications, and the Word of God will not return to him void. Thank you, Chad, so much for coming and being with us, and we wish you well on your way back home. Our prayers will be with you and with your family. His wife, Beverly, has stayed at home and kept the home fires burning and taking care of the children and the things that uh, are necessary in the carrying on of a home and family. And Chad goes forth and preaches the gospel, and we're glad that he came our way. Uh, some might say, well, we've had no visible responses during this meeting. There was one last night who requested prayers following the services, Brother Alan White acknowledged things were not right in his life and requested prayer, and that was made for him. And uh, we congratulate Alan and compliment him on his desire to do what's right. But the truth of the matter really is that there have been as many responses as there have been people who attended. Everybody who comes to a service like this responds, either in one way or another. Maybe a positive way, could be a negative way. But all of us are impacted in some way or the other when we attend and hear God's Word. May our hearts be open and receptive to it. I want to thank the elders personally, and I know I would, I'm speaking on behalf of so many of you for the elders making this venue possible and scheduling the meeting and having Chad to come and be with us. We appreciate so many of our members who have attended every single service. We have had visitors for every single service. We appreciate those who have prepared the meals and served them and cleaned up afterwards and all the things that go into that. You're to be commended. Brother W.A. Gibbs made a wonderful comment to me this afternoon. He said, now, I've, I've eaten too much twice already today, so I'm not going to be there for the meal tonight. But he said, uh, we have had a great meeting. We have had great preaching. We have had great food. We have had great fellowship. It's just been a great week. And that sentiment should certainly be true on the part of all of us. Uh, there are reading materials, as we have announced, available out there in the foyer. If you're visiting with us, feel free to take any of those. We have House to House, Heart to Heart, Spiritual Sword, our own bulletin, and various tracks on any number of topics. If you see one that would be in of interest to you, there are even some tracks that would go along really well with tonight's lesson about suffering and how to deal with it and things of that nature. So feel free to take any of those and come back and be with us. Uh, our own members are reminded of uh, our services Sunday morning at 9 for worship, 1015 Bible study, and we will be meeting at 1230. We'll have our fifth Sunday schedule in, in place. Brother Justin Malden will be speaking Sunday morning. And uh, Brother Teddy Spivey will be speaking at, uh, in, at the afternoon service following our fellowship meal. We invite all of you to come back and be with us for that. Let's remember all those that were announced as being sick and in the hospitals and facing surgery. Be sure to keep them in your prayers. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? If not, again, thank you for being here. Hope all of you have a great night. Let's sing this wonderful hymn together and engage in a brief prayer and then uh, make our way home. But if you have a need that you just can't suppress and uh, you can't go to sleep, you give some of us a call. 
And Brother Chad, I know, would be glad to delay his travel back to Cookville or whatever. Let us know. The invitation of the Lord is still open. I'd like to stay here longer than Mandel's Hiding Day and watch the green changes of our sunny young way. But in my sacred coffee, to that sweet home of God, I'll live with him forever in glory by and by. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory by and by. I'll tell him sing the story. bow with me. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this beautiful day that you've blessed us with and for the opportunity to come here and study more about thy word. We're thankful for this series of gospel meetings and we pray that each of us will dwell on the things that have been presented to us and apply them to our own lives and spread the messages we've heard to others. We pray that you'll bless Brother Chad as he leaves us. We pray that you'll give him safe travels home, be with his work in Mississippi and be with his family pray that you'll continue to bless the congregation here at Carthage and all faithful congregations of thy people the world over. Father, we're mindful of those who are sick and who have been mentioned with heartaches and things that we may not even be aware of. We pray that you'll bless and comfort each of them and help us as fellow Christians to comfort them as we have opportunity. Father, we pray that you'll be with each of us as we leave this place to keep us safe and forgive us when we fail thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.